Donna Curry. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm going to follow up on some of the themes that Minchin um, started out with, talking about the stable macro situation versus the unstable micro situation when you think about ethnic minorities in China. Um, the recent events in China over the past two years in Tibet and Xinjiang have been a rude reminder to most Chinese that they do in fact live in a multi-ethnic society. Um, the, you know, in talking about ethnic communities in China, you have to, I have to make some caveats to begin. Um, the Chinese talk about 56 ethnic nationalities in China. I'm going to focus the, my remarks on the, what, what you would think of as the four small stars in the Chinese flag, the Tibetans, the Uyghurs, the Mongols, and the Manchu, who are the communities that, if you can put it this way, and I have to use gross generalizations because of the time limits here, but um, the communities that have kind of a colorable claim to some independence from the Chinese state, a pre-existing nationhood, if you will, before 1949. Um, and talking about these communities and their relationship with the Chinese state, you are looking at very divergent narratives here to frame the policy that, as it exists. The Chinese government talks about their relationships with these ethnic groups in a very paternalistic way, and the policies are quite paternalistic, um, even in the most positive light. They discuss how all the things that they're doing for these ethnic minorities, the benefits that they provide them, the subsidies that go into their areas, um, the protective policies that have been put in place. This is the narrative of the Chinese state, both at home to the domestic audience and abroad when talking about their ethnic communities. Um, the same narrative when, um, when heard through the ears of the ethnic minorities, on the other hand, is one of colonialization, assimilation. And you can look at three kind of distinct areas of the policy as it exists, as examples of, that highlight this, this divergence of the narrative, if you will. Um, when you look at the government, a, a good example of it is if you go and look on the, um, I think it's on the Xinhua website right now, the new white paper on ethnic minorities policies that the Chinese government's just released, it does not, it barely mentions, if at all, the recent unrest in Tibet and Xinjiang. It's all about the statistics and the numbers of all of the money and the indicators that, that the Chinese government looks at to show that its ethnic minorities policy is working. And they really seem to, to believe and internalize this, this um, idea that their policies are working, despite what most people would look at as prima facie evidence to the contrary in light of the unrest. Um, the minorities themselves obviously have a very different point of view. Um, when you talk about, like I said, three particular incidents, um, with Han migration into Tibet and Xinjiang is a good example. The Chinese government sees this as a way of helping these backward areas to develop, bringing in skilled labor, bringing in, um, bringing in people to populate these sparsely populated areas. They see this as a beneficial policy to the ethnic minorities. Um, of course, there are benefits to the Chinese state project as well, but we're not gonna really talk about those. Um, but and when you look at it from the ethnic perspective, this is, Colin, is a, a colonial type of policy of bringing in settlers to swamp them demographically. And so, you know, one, one policy to very different narratives on it. The economic development is the same situation. The Develop the West initiative that the Chinese government touts as improving the livelihoods of ethnic minorities, and they talk about the GDP gains in these areas, the, the national average being eight, nine percent, the average in these in Xinjiang and Tibet being 14, 15 percent economic growth. But, and, and they look at this as how they're benefiting these ethnic communities. On the ethnic community side, they see it where the benefits are not coming to their communities, they're going to the settlers that are coming in, the, the Han Chinese and Wei that are moving in, and to the government itself. And the infrastructure projects are not seen as really necessarily benefiting the, the ethnic communities, but more for the benefit of the state building project. The, and they also see the economic damage or the environmental damage that this economic development is causing their communities as a major problem. In Tibet, this is a very serious issue. 
Um, educational benefits are another area where you would think that the, the educational benefits that are provided by the state, they give extra points to ethnic minorities on the state entrance exam into universities. There are a whole range of, um, of affirmative action activities that the state provides to the ethnic minorities. Um, and they talk about these, again, in their domestic pr propaganda and how they, how they discuss the ethnic issue domestically inside China as <coughs> benefits to the, ch to the ethnic communities. The ethnic communities, again, have a very different point of view about these. They see this as part of the assimilationist, sinicization effort of the state towards their communities. And even those, um, the members of the elite or those ethnic, um, ethnic uh, individuals that are able to take advantage of these um, benefits, they find themselves unable to get jobs after university because they're competing against Han Chinese in a, in a job marketplace where they, they're competing against less educated people, but they lack these kind of cultural, linguistic advantages that even a less educated um, Chinese person has in competing for even menial jobs. So. It, these benefits tend to be illusory for the ethnic communities, whereas the state touts them as, as, a big, as a burden that it seems to willingly take on to help these communities. So you see this divergence of narrative when you're talking about the policies, and this has some really corrosive effects within, the society, within Chinese society, and these get magnified through the propaganda efforts that the government undertakes both domestically and internationally. When you're looking, you know, when you're looking at how they talk about, again, internally talk about ethnic issues, as mentioned, alluded.